tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled is photographer Lloyd Ziff and author Doe Mayer. Photographer Lloyd Ziff was born in Detroit but raised in Beverly Hills. He graduated from Beverly Hills High and attended Santa Monica City College and Arts Center. That was before he went to Pratt Institute where he earned his Bachelor of Fine Arts. When I met Lloyd years ago, he was an art director for a West Coast magazine. He's designed books, he's taught design to presti in prestigious <laughs> schools, <laughs> he's um, won awards, he's had art shows which have led to his work being included in many museum collections and where should we start Lloyd? Where would you like to start? With my <laughs> photographs, here they are. <laughs> As an art director days, what did you do and uh, how was, did that work? I was an art director for close to 30 years. I loved print. I liked seeing something in the world and sharing it with a million other people. And I liked and through, uh, through magazines through you could magazines. do that? Right. I, I, the first one I worked at was at McCall's, which was a little bizarre. Really? Yeah. I didn't uh, know that. Either. And uh, that was my first job after when I graduated. I stayed there a year. And then after that, I did Rolling Stone in San Francisco, New West in Los Angeles. So you came back to L.A. Right. after Pratt. I came back I to mean, L.A. after McCall's. After McCall's and a little bit in Europe. And, uh, did you? And but were you photographing, were you shooting I, yourself? I always took photographs for myself. Always carried my Leica M2. And wherever I traveled, and I traveled quite a lot actually, um, I, I always took photographs for myself. Meanwhile, I was building a career that I was proud of as an art director, but what I really did for me was my art, for, was photography. On, on the side, you know, the did you ever put your art in any other every magazines? Every once in a while, every once in a while, I'd sneak it in. <laughs> <laughs> because you had to work with the photo editor, right? Exactly, and you had to give your approval of what they were saying. E exactly, and sometimes I had exactly the right photograph to uh, illustrate a story, and occasionally I actually assigned myself a photograph. Like once we had oh, a photograph. Philip Johnson when I was art directing House and Garden and I thought I've always wanted to see the glass house in Connecticut so I practiced shooting reflections against glass. <laughs> so that you could go do I, it? Yeah, I, I went to Philip Johnson's house and photographed him and you know and uh, Alex Lieberman at, at oh, Clandy right. Nass said who took this photograph? And I said, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that takes us to Condé Nast, yes. of course. House and Garden right. was, um, you did all these re redesigns. I did. I, I was asked by uh, Condé Nast to go back to New York in 1980 and uh, art direct and redesign House and Garden, which was lots of fun. And, and then, which was great. You got an award. Yes, we won, we won the most you know, prestigious magazine design award, the ASME award in 19, I guess, 84. And then they were re reviving Vanity Fair in, in 1982. And I was the first art director of that, which was a dream come true, but also it was like one of those be careful what you wish for. Kind because of. it was so much work. But did you have, char uh, were you in charge of the covers? Did you work yes. on the covers? Of Vanity Fair? Of all of all uh, Yeah, of, every, of all of them, yeah. I mean, but it, one of the great things about working on a magazine is the collaborative process. Uh. So if you work with a smart editor, it's really fun. And you, you stop remembering, you know, who came up with what idea because the uh. energy in the office is so high. But, you know, sometimes you don't have that with, with the editor and then it's, uncomfortable. But could you say, I think uh, I should have so-and-so photograph this? Did yes. you ever suggest photographers? Oh, oh definitely. Definitely. And, and, and because it was Condé Nast, and also previous to that, Rolling Stone, I got to work with some of the best, best photographers in the world and also be get, become friends with them. Annie Leibovitz and I are still are very close friends. 
from 1974 when I slept on her floor in San Francisco. <laughs> Did you give her the assignment? Uh, she, she had the assignment. <laughs> she was listed on the method as chief photographer. Oh, she was already. Uh, but we had to convince Jan Winner why she was so important to the magazine. Um, and, and he eventually got it. Right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and kept it. But, but, but no, he didn't keep it. We, got, we stole her away to go to Condé Nast when well, we, we revived Vanity Fair. Oh, but that was yeah, after a while. That was after a while. Yeah. I remember the one cover you did with David Hockney, the two-color socks. That was fabulous. This is when we, you know, that was like the third or fourth issue of the revived Vanity Fair from 1939 to 1982. And I met David, I think, through you, actually. I owe that to you. And I went up to his house and I said, David, could you, we, we really didn't know what to do. This was a year before Tina Brown came to the magazine and figured out what to do with it. We, we thought it was going to be sort of a smarter Rolling Stone or, or, or New Yorker. So I asked David if he would do a cover for us. And he just gave me a, a carousel with, let's say, 20 to 40 transparencies. And I picked the one of the, of, with the multicolor, with the two different two socks. Different socks, which was a really uh, historic photograph, I think. And, it, it, and because it was shown on that, and as you say, it gets to hundreds of thousands exactly, of people. Exactly, exactly. And that, that was always what I loved about being an art director. You're, besides the awards that we talked about, you won the New York Art Directors Award, the LA Art Directors Award, and for, I guess, House and Garden, that national uh, magazine right. award, which is the top award. Yeah, it's like a Calder Mobile. Yeah, I exactly, think it's great. exactly. And, and it, yeah, that was very exciting. Uh, it's a big, it's like the Academy Awards of magazines at the, at the Waldorf Astoria exactly, Ballroom. Exactly, yeah. And when, when, and now that you're not art directing, or are you art directing no, at all? No, I'm not at all. I stopped three and a half years ago because that way art directors take me seriously as a photographer. Before, yeah, it, was, it was a hobby. You but know? it was pretty gutsy to stop because you were so good at your job well, and you could... And, it, and I, you know, people say that to me and I appreciate that, but I felt that I had to do that. And I had already accomplished what I wanted to do as an art right. director. There, I had done many major magazines and if, if, uh, if I got another magazine, it wouldn't have changed my portfolio in any way. And, and, um, and, right. um, or, or my resume, and and meanwhile, I would I'd been pursuing the photography, showing to various galleries, and 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 trying to get people to be serious about my work, as, and as I was serious about my when work. When you go to a gallery, does the gallery tell you what he wants? The gallery director tell you what you should photograph? No, no. You come with a body of work, right? Uh, I I come with a body of work, and they decide whether they like it or not. And then what about with magazine work? Do they Ma still tell you what to do? Yes, magazine work is on assignment. And uh, and you do a little of that for fun. I, oh, I, I love think, doing that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Condé Nast Traveler sent me twice to Europe. Oh, you right. know, really, really beautiful uh, uh, jobs, you know, uh, to photograph uh, Belgium and, and the little region of France. But uh, you can do it on your own. Yes, they, uh, yeah, or you know, I've also done portraits for a magazine called Real Simple, and uh, they say, well, you know, I'd like to have, you know, a lovely portrait of this woman, uh -huh. and blah, 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 and yeah, or if somebody wants very specific pictures, I sort of feel they're not the great art director that I was, you know? That's what but, I wonder. What, what do you, you doubt their, right. do you question well, what they're Well, what asking? you want to do with, with talent, I think, is give talent a home to do their best work, mm -hmm. and if you tell people, well, I want them sitting to the left and have their uh, oh, arms crossed right. and uh, have, the, <laughs> have the baby over on the side. Then you're doing their work for them in a way that spoils the spontaneity of the, of the shot. And also, editorial magazines don't, doesn't pay very well anyway. So th the way you seduce great talent to do their oh. best work is you give them a home for their best, for their best work. But I see what you're saying because that's what you did for other people. And when we were at interview, we did the same thing. Right. We didn't pay very much, but what a, the photographer wanted to do was uh, exactly ruled. because you're hiring someone for their talent. Exactly. And you know, only insecure art directors, I think, really tell people what to do. You had you have a show at Earl McGrath's gallery. Oh. Earl McGrath has a gallery in New York on 57th Street and one in Los West Hollywood on Robertson, and he has these photographs up. How did you decide what to put in that show? And Earl, should I go through these? I'll wait a little bit okay. and I'll answer that one. And Earl 
Um, Earl, I showed Earl my work a year ago, and he said he could give me a show in Los Angeles um, this May. And um, we looked through my body of work from 1970 to 19 to 2003. Oh, I see. And oh. he chose basically what what he felt he wanted to exhibit to exhibit, oh. but. You know, they're all my pictures. I like them all. So I was sort of, you know, okay, Earl, whatever you, whatever you choose, how, really. How do you go through the process? Like, let's look at some of these. All right. This, the one you're holding up now, that is the block where I grew up in Los Angeles. It's on Gregory Way between uh, a, a block or two east of uh, Robertson. And, but it looks so uh, glamorous. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's me. I mean... I, that's exactly how I felt about Los Angeles growing up. I still do, actually. It has the light of Los Angeles, you know, which is so famous. That's why they make movies here. It has the shrubbery that, that's, been, right. that's, been, that's been shaped. It has a convertible. I hope you can see that. We're, yeah, right uh, on the side. Yeah, in yeah, the yeah, center. It has the architecture, the palms. There's even a hose. I don't know if you can see that. The, the, the hose sort of like a homage to David Hockney. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just... And, and this also is, is, a, is one of my L.A. photographs, the, the, the sort of tortured shrubbery, again, oh, and, and, the, and right, the harsh yeah. light, and, uh, and the parking meters. Yeah, the parking meters, yeah, the, parking <laughs> meters. The, the small palm right, trees. That's off, right, that's right off, in the Miracle Mile, right off Wilshire Boulevard. This is in the desert in, in Joshua Tree. This was uh, on assignment for uh, an airline magazine in Hong Kong to just photograph uh, the desert. Uh, Joshua tree, and this is an Akatia plant. And, uh, but, the, but the clouds and the mountain in the background and all those kind of things just add to the thank you. excitement of an Akatia tree. Yeah, right? exactly. Akatia. exactly. Okay. Now, I'm also working on a, on a book called My Friend's Children. And uh, about 15 years ago, my friend started having children. <laughs> And, and I found myself taking pictures of them. And then one day, someone actually said to me, well, you should do a book. And it just sort of clicked. So I'm and working. you should have thought of that yourself. I should have thought of that myself. <laughs> and, so. I, and so I started taking pictures of a lot of uh, my friend's children. That little boy's name is Tennessee. <laughs> and, uh, Perfect. Huh? Uh, yeah. And this one. Oh, another oh, and one. Oh, this, this is Tallulah. And uh, I, I was doing an assignment for a wonderful German magazine, which you know, called Kids Wear. And this is you last know that is the most photo. It's like for photographers. Yes, isn't and, and it? I've heard that in Germany, it's like the hardest magazine for photographers to break into. And why? And and how they print the work right. is it, the way it's. Yeah, it's really really elegant. I had seen it. I mean, nobody knows about it. It costs like twenty eight dollars if you can find <laughs> it on the newsstand. It comes out twice a year. But I was judging an art directing show in New York last year, and I saw it, and I ripped out the masthead and wrote them a letter, and. Uh, it said, I photograph children. You and know, here's I'd like another to child you. that you right. photographed. So, um, yeah, the so they sent me all these bathing suits last October, and I photographed some of my friends' children in bathing suits, as oh, you so know. these were things. Right. Oh, yeah, they're great. Right. So we're working so on that. So the shadows. Book. Do you look for, I mean, do you use a lot of lighting? What I do don't you use any lighting. I have, I have uh, natu it's called, you know, natural light, and... Uh, uh, I just walk around with my Leica strapped to my wrist. You have your favorite camera? It's an old camera? It's an old camera. I just got a new camera, a new Leica M2. You won't it like it. You love your old camera. I know. I, I didn't bring it to Los Angeles from New York, actually. But it makes all this, or is this the way you have them printed? The well, light? no, it, this is what it does. I, I do have a great printer in Los Angeles. I used to print my own work, but actually, I have a great printer in Los Angeles. That was from <laughs> Condé Nast Traveler in uh, France last year. So he knows how to print it? You, you yes. take the picture, you just, because well, I, I mean, saw you working. You kind of watch for the sun right. to move a certain way, and they, they, they make their own um, stream of light coming exactly. into your... Um, well, I learned, I, I learned, you know, I've been shooting with one type of film, Kodak Triax, for literally 30, slightly over 30 years, and I pretty, what, pretty well know what it does. Uh, oh, so and uh, so it's not going to surprise me too much what, what the film is going to do, and, uh, so you can manipulate it. And, you, you, I mean, you can, in a well, way? you can. You, uh, yeah, you just take the, you just make you the just picture, <laughs> and then you know Keith is a great printer, and sometimes they'll tell me, Lloyd, you should have exposed that a little longer, a little oh, shorter. So, but but he can compensate for it. 
And uh, I should give him a plug, Keith Williamson. <laughs> Keith Williamson. I yeah. mean, because of the, the work on the set and the work that's in the gallery, he, he does all of your printing. That's what happens with a photographer, I guess. Yes. He has a favorite. Yeah, he's been doing my printing for quite a little while, and he, he has all my negatives here. And so w when I sell a print, I call him and say, you know, print number 307. And, and uh, then it's done. Yeah, and then it goes done. off to a museum, a gallery, or whatever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that you came. We're Thank glad you. to have you today. You're back in your hometown. I, I know am. you live in New York. I, and, uh, I live in New York, but I come here quite often. Do you want to talk about this one? Oh, let's just do this one yeah. last one. All right. Forgot. That's, that's the, the oldest historic. picture that's going to be in the show. It's Robert Maplethorpe and Patty Smith in about 1969 or 1970. When very young. Very young, babies. We were all babies. And Robert and I had gone to Pratt together and we were good friends. And, and he was living with Patty next door to the Chelsea Hotel. And, and, and he asked me to take some pictures of them. This is before he started taking pictures. Oh, that was and so great. Yeah. That is historic. Yeah, and we, start, and we were friends until he died. And I'm still friendly with Patty if I get to see her when she's not traveling. That's yeah. great. Thanks, Lloyd. Thank you, Joan. What a treat. Thank you. And thanks for watching this part of the show. Don't go away because we'll be back with Doe Mayer, who will tell us everything about filmmaking. Hi, welcome back. I'm Joan Quinn, and I'm here with author Doe Mayer, who was born and raised in New York. She earned a Bachelor's of Art from New York University in Film History and a Master's from USC. She studied at uh, the American Film Institute. And Doe, uh, we've mentioned all these top-of-the-line film schools. What took you there in the first place? Was there film in your family? There was, although everyone thinks I'm the mayor of Metro Goldwyn Mayor, and I am oh, not. Is that right? They I do. Not, they I know do. you aren't because I went to school with the mayor. Oh, right. <laughs> but that's been a constant confusion for all my life. But you, your family my, was. Yes, my grandfather was in film, um, and actually wrote a book called The Movies. It was published by Simon and Schuster. Oh, he so did. So it was write sort of nice that we came back to working and, with Simon and Schuster. And your father. Oh, that's right. For your creative filmmaking right. from the inside out. Right. <laughs> Let's get that. Right. Um, your aunt was in movies? That's right. My Aunt Aline was, uh, Aline McMahon was a well-known character actress in the 30s and 40s. Do you remember her? Did Very you? well, vividly. Um, lived a long time. She lived well into her 90s and was active. Is that for right? many, many years. And your father was a? My father was a film lawyer. So Which, film Was he with been. a studio? No, nope. he worked he independently did. in New York City. And when you finished your master's, from USC. What did you do? What were you going to do? I went and got more initials. I went to the American <laughs> Film Institute. Oh, you went after that? Yes, I went after that. In directing? In directing. Yes. Yeah. So I got, I always say I got all the initials, NYU, USC, and AFI. Well, those are the best, aren't they? <laughs> oh, they're very good. Why they're is NYU so good? Um, I, well, when I went, it really, I wasn't going to film school so much. I really wanted a liberal arts education, which is, I think, a very good background for anyone uh -huh. studying to go into any of the arts or anything else. Uh -huh. Um, so but it's a great film school It is school a great now. film school. It's a and, terrific film school. And SC has always been a great film That's school. That's right. And AFI, which I went to in its second year of existence, was also but a terrific education. But why, why are they so good? Well, I, I think probably for different reasons. I mean, USC and AFI, which I probably know better, um, USC is, is a very broad background in filmmaking. You really learn the whole thing. You learn about sound design and editing and camera. And you're on the faculty there I'm now. I'm now on the faculty yes. 20 years later. Which is great. Is uh, that right? Yeah, yeah, more than 20. Um, AFI is a more specialized education. You go in as a director or a cinematographer. Um, mm, or right. a, um, With some experience? Possibly, not always. Oh, um, oh. But it's a more specialized, limited kind of education. USC really wants to turn out a full filmmaker who has the menu of skills. So coming out of these top schools that we're talking about and knowing what you're doing supposedly, theoretically, you know, do you still have to go through the ranks of menial work if you're yes. working on a film? Because you worked on, what, three or four or five films? I worked uh, on Name a, films. Yes. <laughs> uh, when, I, when I left AFI, I, was, I went to work, um, it actually was a fun story, I worked on Shampoo. I had met Warren Beatty. Um, as a student. He had seen my student film and liked it and I wrote a letter because I was told that's what you're supposed to do and I said I, I hear you like my student film, how would you <coughs> recommend I get a job? 
And about six months later, he called me out of the blue one day. Luckily, I recognized his voice because he didn't say who he was. <laughs> um, and he said, what are your politics? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, what were you doing during the election in 1968? And oh. I said, I was in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, working for Eugene McCarthy. Perfect. Huh? And he said, great, do you want a job? And I said, huh, what job? And he said, I'm making a movie called Shampoo. It takes place on election day in 1968. And I want someone to find the television um, footage for the background of scenes in the movie, the real TV that was happening oh. during that period. I want to really recreate that period on television. So I and a colleague of mine from the AFI actually went and did all the research and found all the uh, material that was appropriate. And that started me on a very weird path. I was just going to say, I think that took you into documentary, actually, filmmaking. It yes, it did. It, uh, it did take me Were there. you thinking of doing that at no, the time? No, no, really I wasn't. That's interesting, because I know you, you teach documentary, and you, d is it the same as the, the narrative film? Not really, well, is it? Well, we actually, yes. I, th I mean, there's narrative in documentary as well as in fiction films. You know, people always say that uh, fiction is the narrative and nonfiction is something else. But we actually think that any good film has a narrative, and documentary uh, especially. Especially documentary, yeah. because you don't understand what's going exactly. on if you don't have a storyline exactly behind right. it. That's exactly but right. But for years, documentary has been like the big D, the horrible thing to be in. Boring. I know. Why? I don't well, think documentaries are boring. There are certainly lots of boring <laughs> documentaries, and I think oh, many of us got uh, you know, brought up on them. Um, but it, I, to me, it isn't at all boring. And you know, I have found it an incredibly vital, exciting part of filmmaking. Um, in our book, one of the people we interview is uh, Renee Tajima Pena, who's a documentary filmmaker. Oh, yeah, I saw that. And um, you know, who speaks, I think, very articulately about creativity in documentary. You know, when you talk about documentary, it's like, you have to find a way to make it interesting That's if right. you're creative. It's like a one-person show. I always think those stage shows are so interesting because they do different lighting or they do different movement on stage or they use different props. And so you have to find that creative process. Yes, and you really have to find the story. You have to find it through character. What goes through, character yeah. is what makes stories interesting in documentary and in fiction. Um, so, you know, in many ways it's the same process. And it, yeah. We have, we have this book, Creative Filmmaking, uh, and you you've actually have photographs. I'm going to just show it because I think it's so interesting, of real people. I mean, I don't think... The real filmmakers. Yeah, real, I mean, like snapshots of real filmmakers, which I thought was pretty, an interesting way to show them. Uh -huh. I don't know. It just seems strange to me. Huh. It almost was like if somebody's at, at a casting call, they they know what that person looks like, or uh -huh. if they're working uh -huh. with them, this uh -huh. shows you what what they look like. But um, what was the thinking behind using those kind of photographs? Well, I think the thinking behind the idea was to find 15 filmmakers at all different parts of the process, from documentary or on a page there with Renee to John Wells, who's a television producer. Um, to Anthony Minghella, right, director, right. to, uh, Wal to uh, Walter Murch, who's a sound designer, and then to take all those interviews with the 15 different filmmakers at all their different parts of the process and try to extract out of that some ideas about creativity and filmmaking. So then after that, you have this list of five key... Five keys to the art of creative keys. filmmaking. Say right. Five right. keys to the art of creative filmmaking, yeah. which are... Which are inquiry, knowing yourself. Again, something I would argue is important in any kind of creative field, but certainly is important in filmmaking. Um, introspection. Uh, well, inquiry is obviously the broader world. Introspection is knowing yourself. Intuition, sort of oh. the imagination, the They're all eyes, right? They're all eyes. The five eyes, there right. five eyes. Right, okay. So, so the third is intuition. Uh -huh. uh, the fourth is interaction. The, the whole act of collaboration and how important that is to film. And the fifth is impact, um, how film affects an audience, how it affects you, and how you use that to go on and make other kinds of films. So once you've got these five eyes, you go through in, in the book and explain how to apply them, I guess, in filmmaking. Well, we ch talk to each of these filmmakers about how they use them their own oh, way. Oh, I see. You use, oh, um, they tell they you. They tell us. And then we also devised a set of what we call limberings, little exercises you can do for fun. Um, to sort of see how it feels to try these ideas out. And we also have a chapter in the book called Workouts, which is taking these ideas and more broadly putting them 
into work as you make a film. Do you teach these processes at SC in I the do. classes? Yeah, we've because you wrote this with some with two, two other people. Right, I wrote it with my husband Jed Dannenbaum and a colleague Carol Hodge. We all three of us teach at USC. And what do they teach? Um, they, we all teach everything. We actually oh, you, all oh, you broadly do. teach film production. Oh, I see. So what kind of words of wisdom would you have for someone going into the business? Obviously, you didn't stay in the business. No, not in that sense. I mean, sense. in that sense, not because that you're sense. teaching. Although I also work as well as a professional filmmaker, which do is you? so that I can do both and know uh -huh. something about what's going on. And, and do you look at, what, what do you tell these people? What do you, <laughs> in your class? Well, I think, you know, we do start with this idea of who are you? What's important to you? Mm. Um, what do you care passionately about? What would make you a more authentic, creative person? Uh. Um, and, you know, I would argue that's true for not just filmmaking. When you're in class, can you tell if one of your students is going to be a big success? No. <laughs> I wondered no, if you could. You no, know, it's fascinating. <laughs> you, you see the ones who are successful in film school, and sometimes those are the ones who are That's terrific in the real world. And sometimes, you know, they're who their uncle is, or their timing, um, or the fact that they mature into something. You know, you don't know that. You can't tell. You, sometimes you, you can tell, but, but many times but, you can't. Um, um, do you look at film as an art form? I look at it both as an art form and a commercial do you? framing of the world, sure. Because when you look at it as an art form, I think that brings out the creativity, which is your creative film making, is what you say. Um, but so many people get hung up on that commercial. Right. Well, people need to make a living, you know? <laughs> and our students need to make a living. Um, one of the nice things, of course, now about filmmaking is amateurs make films all the time, or, or people can have their own camcorder and their own electric editing system at home, their own digital systems. and you know, make their own movies for fun. And even then, a book like this can be sort of helpful at thinking about that. Even without going to school? Correct. Oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Well, what's the next book? Don't know. Haven't got there yet. Uh, this has taken a lot of years and a lot of evolution of thinking and a lot of testing with students. Um, I was going to ask you, how long did it take? Well, altogether about four or five years. Oh, it did. And then we tested a lot of it out with our students. In we, what way? Well, these limberings, these ideas, for instance, of, ta of doing a little, trying something out. Um, there's a one point in the book where John Lasseter, who's the great animator, talks about... Um, so where his ideas come from, and he picks up a coffee cup, and he says, you know, this cup is really happy. It's fill, it's fulfilling its function. It's got hot coffee in it. It's all filled up. It's ready to serve you. Uh. It's a happy cup. And then he drank some of the coffee, and he said, you know, as the coffee goes out of the cup and the coffee cools up, the cup loses its oh, it's it's it's, 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 it's exactly it's I see. what it is, and it becomes a sad cup. And when it's finished and you throw it away, it's actually the saddest cup in the world. There's mm. nothing left so in it. So those are the kind of things, you, that's very interesting, because those bring out your emotions. Exactly. And our emotions are out, because we have to stop. Okay. We've finished. Thank, thank you, Joan Mayer, for being with us. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles today. Keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, 917. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.